there were over 2,000 children forcibly taken from one family to another. Social workers are instructed by their management, even if the family is a good family, competent family to looking after a child, to advise the court to get the child adopted. So in other words, children have been removed from one family and placed with another family and forcibly adopted merely to satisfy government targets. In the case of the McDougalls, um, they had two children. Kerry McDougall was deemed by the authorities in Scotland to be not sufficiently intelligent or too stupid to get married. And then she was deemed to be too stupid to look after her children. So they left Scotland and went to live in Ireland. I met my wife through friends and we'd been together for about three or four months when she became pregnant. It was very shortly after we found out she was pregnant that I had a knock on the door from two social workers. Five council social work told me that if Kerry was to have the baby, they would take the baby at birth. So the, both social workers told me there's no point in Kerry having this baby. It's better for her to have an abortion. It was a very easy decision to flee because at the end of the day, when it's your, somebody, if a social worker tells you you're going to lose your child, you'll do anything to keep your child. Even if you had to flee to the other end of the earth, you would do it. We lived happily in Ireland for four years until one day my wife had a miscarriage. So we decided to go home for family support for my wife. Uh, we met with Scottish social workers before we went home just to make sure that they wouldn't take the children when they go home. Uh, the Scottish social workers promised us that they wouldn't take the children, that they would only support us if we asked for support. But the day we arrived back in Scotland, two social workers arrived at the door and initiated child protection proceedings to take the children away. We've got permission to talk about our case thanks to John Hemming going into Parliament using parliamentary privilege to open our case up. So it means the social work department can't shut us up, basically. Right. We're going to Scotland today because we have a court case in Dunfermline Sheriff Court tomorrow. So we're about to fly on the plane from Dublin to Edinburgh. Uh, it's quite nerve-wracking, to be honest. And uh, I didn't get much sleep last night. Going to Scotland because I'm, I've got two breach of the peace charges for. I've made a complaint to social workers over the telephone because a social worker in Scotland actually walked into my child's nursery, my four and a half year old son, and he, she questioned my son without my permission. This was a breach of our privacy. It was also against the law. It was against, so I phoned up to complain about that. And the social worker, because I'd phoned up to complain, she, to counteract that, she phoned the police and said that I had been threatening towards her on the phone. This is a video of Ben, and he's telling me that he doesn't want to live in, in, in Inverkeithing anymore because the social workers might come and take him away. He says, we have to get a new house, but not in Inverkeithing, and you won't get arrested by the police, and the social workers won't be able to come and take me away. Dad can we run away so that we can get away from these social workers who are trying to take us away? You know, that's the final thoughts of a four and a half year old going to bed at night. And the social worker won't even find us, because we'll be far away from being our roof and they don't know where I our roof is, even the police. Can you comment something about McDougall's case? I don't Mark, know. Mark and Kerry McDougall, because... Oh, that's the adoption, uh, yeah, the adoption because, without uh, consent. Kerry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, uh, yeah. I don't know specifics about that case. I mean, it's very difficult to comment on any particular case without knowing all the information around it. 
people have confidence in the system and that they don't feel persecuted or you know somebody makes a decision and ticks a box and that's it your child gets taken away I mean I used to say when I managed a team of social workers um, that if only people knew how hard it really is you know to remove a child it's the absolute last thing we do I thought it would be a fair system like it would be in the criminal trial evidence. No, it's just their word against yours and their word to King. My hope is that one day I'll be able to go back and fight for my children, the other two, and get them home. I think it was the 7th or 8th of November 2012. They came to hospital and demanded to take their offers and removed us from hospital. And then on 12th of November, she got removed from that foster carer to another because the foster carer burnt my daughter at three months old. And we are here, the UK parenting protest. They have got our kids. Social workers commit perjury to remove children. took two of my children, Aaron is five and Faith is four, but I was thrown into the 26-week court process. They used false information to take my children. They even used the fact that I have a physical condition to say that my children would grow up to be my carers. Open up the family court, stop the silence. One of the most common reasons that they have in the UK is they say risk of future emotional harm. Now, how do you quantify that? That's almost impossible to quantify, but a lot of people lose their children because the social services and the courts say there's a risk of future emotional harm. The way in which you can get your children back once you've had a final hearing in court is quite difficult. People very rarely win appeals. The appeal system isn't set up for people to win. And this is happening all around the UK. A child taken every 20 minutes. This is the port through which most of the British families come into Ireland. This is Rosslare Harbour. They come here by ferry either as foot passengers or in their cars if they have a car. And I will meet them either here or if they're driving I may meet them up in Wexford which is about 20 minutes away. So this is the point where they first place their feet on Irish soil. I believe that the child protection system child protection in quotation marks because of course it's not far from child protection. I believe that that has introduced a system of fascism. I retired from working as a journalist and writer about seven, eight years ago and I began to do human rights work and I had a website called ectopia.org and I expanded it to cover parents in trouble with social services. Since mid 2013, 200 families have contacted me looking for help. 40 families in that time have come here, uh, some with children and some coming here pregnant to have their babies here. In a state of panic and uh, lost, you can't think properly, make all kinds of mistakes and do stupid things because they're not thinking right. I helped them get a cheap place and to spend a week or so recovering and uh, learning the law and have a look at what the, uh, the options are. Now that's the safe house, as we call it, the barn. Fine stone building, it's about 200 years old. It used to be for animals. There's a ring inside on the wall for the bulls and owls. When my late wife and I retired down here 20 years ago, we converted it, we put in windows. I'll put on some lights, although you probably have very good light on the camera. Well, the first thing we need them to do is as quickly as possible find cheap lodgings, because obviously, they, they can do that in a few days. They often think they can do that in three or four days. 
I think the older you are and the more alone and the fact you become a widower, I think that gives you a certain amount of um, independence that you can take risks and do things that I don't necessarily want to say too much about myself. Social services are saying the state knows best and families cannot be trusted and parents are a threat to their children. I and my colleagues say evolution has decided, not the state, that the best people look after children are their parents. Up to five years ago, there was the, the, most, the, the only abuse was physical abuse, neglect and sexual abuse. And we put this physical abuse and neglect in the same category. So then there were two and a half thousand cases each year reported to um, social services in the UK of physical abuse come neglect and sexual abuse. Two and a half thousand it took causes for intervention. Over the five years, a new category has come into being called emotional abuse. And last year, there were 13,800 cases of emotional abuse involving social services intervention. Because this is the result of an unholy alliance between social workers and the psychiatric profession. Then there's also the concern about the capacity of some parents. Um, and uh, it's become particularly contentious around adults with learning difficulties um, as to what is their capacity to parent children. And again, some judgments are being made by medical profession um, and others um, that, uh, that some parents should not be even be given the chance to parent um, uh, because there's, uh, people are not confident that they have the capacity to parent. We've got uh, William, who's 12, is my oldest. And Grace is seven. And then little Sam is just five. When all this sort of first started, we did take a holiday. We went to Ireland for two weeks. When we first left, we weren't sure whether we were taking a holiday or whether we were just not going to come back. At the time, we, we really didn't know what to do. The other parent went to the police to do what they call a Sarah's Law request, which is basically to check on his background. There was a, a false allegation against Darren a number of years ago by his ex-wife, which was proven to be false. They wanted to visit us the, in the early stages every 10 days to two weeks. They visited our children in school without asking our permission or, or advising us that that's what they were doing, which caused problems in itself. For a couple of weeks after that, Grace was actually scared to go into school. We came across so many stories of uh, children being taken for the most spurious reasons. And of course, once they have your children, it's very difficult to get them back. But now, our case is closed as far as social services is concerned and um, you know we will carry on with our legal action against them but as I say if there's a knock at the door and I'm not expecting somebody it, it's scary and I, I don't, can't do that anymore so we we would consider you know in the right circumstances financially and what have you we'd consider leaving the country and unfortunately you know a lot of people don't know how to react when they first come into their lives, you know, they, they, they think, well, you know, we haven't done anything wrong, so we, we just, you know, we just work with them, and, and that's one of their favourite phrases that they use, you know, work with us, and that. they don't want to work with parents, you know, they, they want to misrepresent them, lie about them, you know, we have learnt an awful lot, so where we can, we, you know, we share and support people. I put together people's court work, court paperwork for them. I'm always researching the law because there's so many instances where the law is broken. I mean, this, this is one of the letters that we did to the minute, Darren. This is the one that we did where we asked them. They accused us of um, me abusing the seven-year-old. They accused um, Catherine of having an incestual um, relationship with what would have been her ten-and-a-half-year-old son then. Um, Tried to say that Lucas was his father, didn't they? Yeah, because he had Down syndrome. They were saying that Lucas was uh, Jonas's father. We had to disprove that, which we did. We had no worries with that. 
for six to seven months while he was in care, we kept saying to people he was in serious trouble. I went and fought the um, interim care order on the 4th of October with my solicitor saying he's covered in bruises, he's ill all the time, he's, he's sick, he, the, the dog's const- jumping, constant he's constantly, sore bottom, yeah, didn't he? he was coughing and joking all the time. Because, Diarrhea. And the foster carer said, no, he doesn't have that anymore. Yet he was taken in on the 8th of October, waking up, not being able to breathe. And now it's been proved that when he had his autopsy, because he eventually died in in foster care. He had um, the uh, rotavirus, which is caused from dog feces, which he was constantly coming in into contact, stinking of dog, dog mess. This is part of my diary. He was still sleepy in the car. They took him inside to wait for the foster carers. His face was flushed and he was very hot to the touch. He was so hot that he had wax leaking from his ears. He could not see out of his right eye as it was stuck together with nasty green mattery and crusty discharge known as conjunctivitis. So, you know. (laughs) And that was what he looked like. How's she doing? Well, she's really not well at the moment because she's stressed. Right. So it's causing physical symptoms and the pregnancy's suffering because of it. I'm not Mark's lawyer and I leave the legal side of things to to the lawyers. However, my understanding is that he's got he's pleaded not guilty to a charge. Uh, quite a minor charge, by the way, a charge that the social worker has brought against him, um, and um, which certainly the solicitor believes is a malicious allegation. This way, this way. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> About five and a half years ago, their troubles started. Kerry went into hospital, had the child, and within a few days the the baby was taken off of her because of concerns passed on from social services in Fife. And it was at that point we became involved because we as an organisation at Nursing Matters advocate for breastfed babies where authorities are interfering with the relationship and our involvement has continued to this day. There's some possibility that the case can be thrown out and that's because um, John Hemming MP said in Parliament that the case was vindictive and um, being vindictive is not a good reason to bring a case so it may be that we can get the the witness statement discredited on that basis. I'm here for uh, quite a minor breach of the peace trial and it's against social workers in Scotland who took my children away and I'm here today to basically defend myself. happy. Yeah. Yeah, Thomas is having a drink, isn't he? Yeah. He's having some water. It's my flag. Yeah, that's my flag. It's very significant to us because they've, they've helped us. The Irish have helped us so much in so many ways. 
Um, yes, those kids are Irish. Our kids are Irish, and I'm I'm proud Thank to be you. here. The difference, what I, how I see between England and Ireland is, the, England may identify that there may be a problem, but they're not willing to help you solve that problem. Ireland will uh, say that yes, the it is work to be done, but they'll show you the ways in which you can accomplish that. That is the difference. Hello. How are you? We're just doing a documentary. Oh, uh, Yeah, it's about move, people moving from England. That's Daisy, and she was the one that was uh, forcibly adopted in 2012, in March. She'll be um, four this year, so um, that'll be a big day for us. We normally just light a candle and we get a bit of cake, so, um, for her. No, I'm not allowed any photographs, so I don't know what she looks like now. It's really sad that I won't be able to see her unless she chooses to see me when she, when she turns 18 and she decides. It's like a grieving process that you go through. Like, it's like she died, but she's still alive, but you grieve. And um, I had to work through a lot to get through that grief. There was a lot of grief there for her. So that's how I lost Daisy. And all because of ah. things that people did to me as a child. I was in care myself and I, I had a really bad upbringing from my, both my parents through drinking and my, my mum used to be a drug user also. And um, I was brought up in care and I was known to social services and over the years I've suffered from depression, I've suffered from mood instability throughout the years. And that's the reasons why I was specifically targeted by social services. Give her a brush look. Oh, honey. Yay! You're doing a good job there, Frankel. Yeah, look. Two weeks before Frankel's due date, a social worker came to our house with paperwork to say that he was going to be removed at birth. And within three or four days, we packed all our life into a van. We hired a van, booked a holiday home in Ireland, and it was the most scariest thing I've ever done ever. Once we got over to Ireland, we didn't know what, we was to, what to expect. It was Christmas. We knew that services weren't going to be open. It was a very lonely, frightening time because Christmas is like a family thing and we had plans for Christmas that we were going to spend with your family, weren't we? Mm. And all that was just literally destroyed. But I, we knew that we just couldn't let the social workers take another baby because we knew what they were going to do. They were going to take it and adopt the baby. And we drove, as we were driving to the ferry port, just feeling sick and stomach going over. And then we got on the ferry and then we were sat there on the ferry. And then as soon as the engines went boom and they started, oh, it was the best feeling ever because we knew once that ferry started moving, that was it, they couldn't touch our baby. I won't go back to England, I will never take, the, these kids will never go, go to back to England because we know if we take the children and I don't know how they'll find out, but social services will take the children. I know parents that have wanted to and have committed suicide. The worst thing that can happen to most parents is to have your child taken. It's worse than death, you know. So it's, uh, it's just, it's, it's wrong. They say Britain has the most robust child protection system in Europe. We can't argue with that. But our response is that Britain may have the most robust child protection system in Europe, but it's the only European country from which families are fleeing. Well, the McDougall's case is a very important case. McDougall's went back and their two Irish-born children were indeed seized. If they win their case, and it is ruled that the children cannot be seized and the children are returned to them, it means that hundreds of other parents here can now 
take their Irish-born children back to Great Britain to see their grandparents safely. She's just getting being monitored, is she? Yeah. Good. Hey, the cramps. Yeah, she's got constant stomach cramps. Okay. Just having she's just having a few complications. When is she due? Um, June. We could drive her down here, no? We could, yeah. She probably would do that. One day I want to apply for Irish citizenship because I don't want to be a British citizen you anymore after everything that's understand. happened. You want to renounce it? Yeah. I don't want to die a British citizen. <laughs> Not only do you want to leave the country, you want to give up your citizenship. Yeah, because it feels horrible that I'm associated with that. That's pretty angry, isn't it? Yeah. How are you? Yeah, all right. That's awesome. It's good to see you. So. Well, basically, they just says that I've got my own modern learning difficulties. It's nothing, well, I don't think it's major. Uh, it won't affect my kids' life. Uh, well, I'm pregnant again. I am worried, which is understandable. It's just, it's too much stress and too much worry on my plate at the moment. This, this is in Scotland, the last few weeks before my children were taken. I knew that they were going to be taken, so I thought I'll document every day of their lives. We just filled every day with fun. We'd go somewhere nice, go for something nice to eat, you know what I mean? We'd stay out until the sun went down, you know what I mean? Because we knew they were going to be taken. <laughs> yeah, sorry. And like that's what I was doing there. Like we were out until about nine o'clock in the evening because the sun was still shining, and I was thinking this could be the last day I have them. Kerry told me to record it because she knew that okay. it would be useful in the future. Here we go. So you're taking our children away. So what we're here to do is to make. You'll be aware that it's a very short-term order, it's an emergency order that will Don't be given to the children to see them. Don't give me that, Robert. So, can I get this right? You took my children away because you've been told that we plan to move on. We've got concerns that you're planning to move on. And that is the reason that you're given. Hmm. It's hard for me to listen to this. Oh, yeah. I love you so much, Chris. Love you and Lachlan so much. <laughs> Just remember tonight when you're lying down, sleeping, and, you, and you're in your bed tonight. Just always remember that I'm thinking about you, yeah? Ben, Ben is that clinging on to, clinging on to me. Because <laughs> Ben, he was four and a half, he knew what was going on. You know what I mean? So Ben was just clinging on to me like this, because he, he didn't want to go. The system is going wrong a very large amount of the time, but it tends to hit the people who are poorer, who are immigrants, who are perhaps not so intelligent or articulate, the people who are not so influential in society. And the, the biggest problem is the absence of independent evidence, because all the evidence, all the strings are controlled by the local authority, the Children's Services Authority. And unless you have independent evidence in the system, you're not going to get independent conclusions because at the end of the day, the judge relies on the experts. The experts are including the social workers who are employees of the local authority. Social welfare, the welfare of a child, is the most important kind of issue. 
So if a child is brought to the attention of police or social work or doctors or whatever, um, because something is wrong, the principle is always, how can we help? Whether that child is offending or whether that child is at risk or in need, the principle is always, how can we help? There are some cases going on where the parents are challenging that adoption order and that is a very hard one because legally at adoption they are no longer a child of those parents. The courts normally say even if it was wrong to make that initial decision to upset the child again and move them back is, is not necessarily the right answer because adoption stays with people for the rest of their lives. This isn't a short-term decision. This is making a decision for the next 70, 80 years of that person's life, um, that they look back on that time in their life and, and they say, but why, why, was that, that, why was that done? Why was I taken away uh, without the consent of my parents? Um, why was I not allowed to stay in touch with my family? As with a lot of these cases that happen in the sheriff courts, they're basically held off for an extra few months. You could go there, you could wait all day, and there's other cases that are more important than yours, so they're seen first. I have to return to Scotland in May for that case. Kerry's four and a half months pregnant, almost five months pregnant now, so the baby will be due in June, and we're hoping that before the baby comes, that the boys will be back in Ireland. We know that even if, the, if we don't get the children back straight away, once we go to the courts, we'll be treated fairly and the children will be returned to us eventually because we've already proved ourselves as good parents in Ireland. Definitely the children will be traumatized for life and it will take a, a long time for them to be normal again once we get them home. I can't go back. Uh... Reason being is because Fife Council will take the baby off me if I return back. Uh.